grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The particular blessing of the Reformation is that all of the cobwebs of man-made rules and regulations and man-made corruptions of doctrine and false teachings that were destructive to the souls of people, all of these things were swept aside when the word of the living God was allowed to shine forth undimmed by confusion and error. And it shone forth and, and with the shining forth of God's truth, Jesus and his redemption shine forth in crystal clarity. And so, our epistle text for today is the essence of the doctrine of the gospel which was restored to the church in the Reformation through the, the servant of the Lord, Dr. Martin Luther. And so I want you to take a look with me at our epistle text today to show how this wonderful truth now shines so brightly for us because of the work of the Word of God, which was enabled to overcome the incrustation and rust of human error. So we begin in verse 19. St. Paul tells us, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, in other words, whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Who is it who is under the law? Every human being is under the jurisdiction of the law, whether they acknowledge it or not, whether they like it or not. They are under the jurisdiction of God's law because they are creatures of God, they belong to God, and they owe him all their love and their duty. And they will be judged on the day of judgment accordingly. So when the law speaks, it speaks to every human being. All right? When the commandments say, Thou shalt not, or thou shalt, thou is you. All right? We always have to keep that in mind. It's not them, it's you. God is talking to you when the law tells you, thou shalt not, thou shalt. All right, so whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped. It amuses me when secular people say, when I get before God in heaven, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. You know, I don't like the way he's been running the show down here. And when I get to see him, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. And I think to myself smilingly, Oh boy, are you in for a rude awakening? All right? The only thing that the only thing that the un, impenitent unbelieving will have to say on the day of judgment is Jesus Christ is Lord, and then they will bow their knee and go to hell. All right? So we want to get the message of the law clear here today. Because that is one of the things that Martin Luther also recovered for us. The law of God in its proper relationship to the gospel. So every mouth shall be stopped 
and all the world shall become guilty before God. That's the message of the law. You are a sinner. You've got no excuse. You are heading for judgment and wrath. Therefore, Paul says in verse 20, by the deeds of the law, by works, no flesh shall be justified in God's sight. No one will be declared righteous in the eyes of God by means of their good works. Why? Number one, they are in unbelief, and those who have no faith cannot please God, no matter what they do. And secondly, all the good works of all people are imperfect at best. All right, so even when we do the best that we can, there is sin in our good works. And therefore, if we were to rely on our good works in order to save us and commend us to God, we would be lost forever. And so the message of the law is, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified, because by the law, is the knowledge of sin. Why did God give us the law, the Ten Commandments? He gave it to us so that we would see how sinful we are. We would look into the mirror of the Ten Commandments and we'd say, honestly, I have broken every one of these commandments a multitude of times and undoubtedly will do so again. So the, the law is like a mirror. We look into it and we see what we need to see. If we do not see this, we will never see the gospel. Now, why are people so blasé in the modern church about the gospel, about the good news and salvation in Jesus? Why are they yawning about that? It's because churches don't preach the law anymore. People don't preach that there is no salvation in the works of the law. And if we were to rely on the works of the law, we would forever be damned. Nobody's preaching that today. What is preached in the modern American affluent churches is soft soap. Soft soap and warmed over psychology. So, the, the first point of our sermon today is not by the works of the law. All right? Boom. How can a sinner be righteous before God? Not by the works of the law. Now, part two. I'm really getting along there. I'm already on part two. All right. Now, Part 2 begins in chapter, 20, uh, chapter 3, verse, verse 21. We are declared righteous by faith apart from the deeds of the law. All right? This is the second and principal part of our sermon today. All right? He begins that, well, let's look down to verse 28, the last verse. He says, therefore we conclude, so he gives us the conclusion of the matter in verse 28. A man is declared righteous by faith without or apart from the deeds of the law. This is the statement of the gospel. How are you declared righteous in God's sight? It is not by the deeds of the law, but it is by faith. You are declared righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. When you trust that for Christ's sake and in Christ's name, your sins are forgiven and you have eternal life, you are declared righteous by God himself and accepted as a holy saint of God through the forgiveness of all of your sins. All right? 
So that is the beginning where we start here in verse 28. A man is justified, declared righteous by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Now, he says in verse 21, Now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. I want to draw your attention to two phrases here. Number one, the righteousness of God. This phrase gave Luther fits when he was in the monastery trying to earn salvation by his good works, by his monkery, and by his doing of all these works of supererogation. All right? He was endeavoring to merit God's favor by his works. And then people would say, well, you should just tr take refuge in the gospel. And he would come to a passage like this, and he would learn that the gospel is all about the righteousness of God. And he'd say, my goodness, that's like pouring sand in the eyes of a person who has been in the desert for a month because he thought of the word righteousness of God as the fact that God is righteous and that therefore God must punish sin. And he said, that's not good news, all right? Because he didn't understand, because the church was not teaching the truth of the word of God, that here the word, the righteousness of God, is not talking about God's personal righteousness, it's talking about the righteousness which God imputes and reckons and credits to our account so that we become the righteousness of God in him through faith in Christ. How is it that your sins are forgiven and that God accepts you as his beloved child? Because God has credited you with the righteousness of Christ and it covers your sins, it covers all of your inadequacies and it, and it results in you being accepted in the sight of God, righteous, declared righteous through faith in Christ. So when Luther understood that the righteousness of God is not about how God is righteous when he punishes sinners, but it's about the fact that God in his righteousness credits sinners with the righteousness of Christ and therefore justifies them and receives them as his holy saints and his dear children. That is the doctrine of justification by grace through faith. And he says, now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. That means it's obvious. How is it obvious? Because it is what the Bible teaches. It's the reason why Jesus came into the world and lived and did miracles and taught and suffered and died on the cross and was buried and raised again on the third day and how he commissioned his church to go into all the world and baptize and teach all nations and so in the church the word of God is preached the sacraments are administered and there is the manifestation of the righteousness of God without the law. So we Christians under the New Testament, the New Covenant, we have a different righteousness. We are not righteous by the works of the law. We are righteous by the faith of Jesus Christ. His holy righteousness and his payment for our sins is reckoned to our account and God looks at the Christian believer in Jesus and says I declare you righteous for the sake of my son he goes on and he says this was foretold 
in the Old Testament. It was witnessed by the law and the prophets. That means the Old Testament promised the coming of this new righteousness. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So this righteousness, this gift of righteousness in God's sight is for everybody to enjoy. And we enjoy it by receiving it in faith. So we are justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he reminds us, he says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, we can never trust in our works because our works are imperfect. They come short of the glory of God. God never gave us our works in order to use them as a stepping stone to heaven. He gave us good works to do for his glory and for the blessing of our neighbor. That's why we do good works, to glorify God and to bless our neighbor. So he says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but we are justified, that is declared righteous, freely by his grace, that is his unmerited favor, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So because Jesus redeemed us with his uh, with his holy, innocent blood and suffering and death. Because that redemption has taken place, we are declared righteous as a free gift, whom God had set forth a propitiation through faith in his blood. So God sent Jesus into the world he set him forth to be a propitiation. That's a fancy word. Propitiation means something that takes away anger and wrath and judgment. There are two, two parties. There is the offending party and the offended party. The offended party, God, is rightly angry with sin, uh, with regard to sin. And human beings in sin are liable to wrath and judgment. Jesus is the propitiation. He, by his suffering, death, and resurrection, takes away God's wrath. He reconciles God to sinners, and therefore God is no longer angry with those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So God has set Jesus forth as a wrath-ending sacrifice, right? And therefore, it declares the righteousness of God, all right? Some people have said, why doesn't God just, just, Forgive sins willy-nilly. Why? You know, he's God. He can do anything. Why doesn't he just choose to ignore our sins and give us all a free pass? What, you know, if God is so interested in us being saved, why doesn't he just forgive us for, for no reason whatsoever? Well, that's the way we think because we're sinners, all right? That's the way we think. God can only act in accordance with his holiness and his righteousness. So therefore, any godly plan of salvation must be two things at once. It must declare God's righteousness and it must declare forgiveness of sins and eternal life for sinners. And so it says that uh, in, in verse 26, to declare, I say, this is the gospel he's talking about, the good news, to declare at this time his righteousness, that he may be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. 
So in the coming of Christ, in the redeeming work of Christ, the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ, in this, God has done a work of redemption that maintains God's righteousness, that God is holy and he punishes sin. But at the same time, the very God who is righteous and punishes sin is also the God who declares righteous those who believe in Jesus. And so through the suffering and death of Christ, God's righteousness is maintained and God's salvation is declared. His, his forgiveness, his life, and his salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. And so, on this Reformation Day, we have this wonderful good news, and this particular passage of Scripture was one of the passages that Luther was meditating upon when he finally had the breakthrough that in Christ we are saved by grace through faith alone. Amen. The peace of God that passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus.